French Brown, attorney at Dean Mead, specializing in state and local tax law, gives us a breakdown of the tax code updates as it relates to commercial and ag real estate. We hope you enjoy. In our Expert Opinion podcast is brought to you by SVN Saunders Ralston Danzler Real Estate, a full service land and commercial brokerage with over $4 billion in transactions since 1996. Okay, welcome back to In Our Expert Opinion podcast. I am one of the hosts, Linda, and I am joined by the other host, Chad. And I'm very excited because we have um, Michael with us today in studio, although Michael. he'll never speak, but he's there. Uh, and actually, Michael and I kind of had a little funny convo before you got in here, and I think I should just start calling it in my opinion, <laughs> no, never an expert, but I do have a, a lot of opinions. Just call it an opinion. <laughs> yeah. Opinions. My own. With yeah. Linda. <laughs> yeah. That's right. And we have another special guest joining us remotely. Uh, and this is Mr. French Brown. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you so much, Linda. Thanks yeah. for coming on. Thank you for Appreciate coming on. You have a very unique name. I love it. I, I don't think anybody could ever forget it, which like, uh, you know, people call me Jessica, people call me, I don't even, Nicole, like, and at this point I'll answer to anything, so. Lakeland Linder. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and French, you are with Dean Mead, right? That's correct. Dean yeah. Mead Law Firm, uh, based in Orlando, but I practice out of the Tallahassee office. Yeah. And um, how long have you been an attorney? So I've been an attorney since 2007. Have you always done tax law? So interestingly enough, I really have. Um, I really kind of got my start uh, and and it, not just tax law, but really I kind of focus on very specific Florida specific taxes. Um, I was lucky enough to get a job at the Florida Department of Revenue just out of law school. So I really got to learn the Florida specific taxes kind of from the inside out, uh, but I've been practicing ever since. So. I always love it when attorneys, you know, maybe they do like environmental law now or maritime law. And I'm like, you know, have you always done that? And they're like, no, I used to do criminal. And I'm like, okay, so something <laughs> happened that made you switch over. Uh, you said in law school, you primarily studied or focused on? Environmental law. Oh. So I wanted to be an environmental attorney. I just knew that that's what I wanted to do. Um, I re even remember in my first year law school class, telling a good classmate that I was never going to be a tax attorney. Stop. Um, and I just joke that the big man obviously has a sense of humor because that's what I've been practicing ever since. Is that is hilarious. Yeah, it seems like, uh, you know, I think that's true in life in general. Anytime I'm like, this is going to be really, really great. It ends up being really, really not great. So we just have to stop uh, speaking things uh, into existence, I guess. That's why I always say that I'm I'm ready to go wherever the wind blows. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, okay. So then you worked for the Florida Department of Revenue, and I feel like I don't know. Are those the real criminals? Like, you know, the people you're dealing with there. You know, generally speaking, um, you know, a lot of state agencies really do try to work and provide guidance to folks, but you know, at the same time, obviously I have lots of clients that have frustrations with the department <laughs> and we get to work through those. Yeah. So, um, but I think generally the, the people in those agencies, you know, they want to do the right thing. Sometimes it can be frustrating how they get maybe to the right answer sometimes, but um, that's ultimately the goal at the end of the day is to, is to get good solutions and really not have people have surprises, right? That's the biggest thing that I find in the law is to make sure that your clients aren't surprised um, as long as everybody kind of knows knowingly what the issues are and how to look at them and, and try to think through them because especially when it comes to taxes, nobody wants a surprise tax bill at the end of the day. Yeah, um, I don't want any surprises from the government as a matter of fact. So I, especially when it comes to taxes, which I already am so um, panicked about, you know, because it, and not that I I don't think that they really like care about me or about my taxes, but I'm always just like, man, my life is going to, you know, my life is going to change in the, in the matter of a second. They're going to come here and like take me away. But 
Yeah, it can be pretty scary stuff. So good to know that uh, there are wonderful firms uh, like Dean Mead and, uh, you know, seasoned professionals that kind of know the inside like you. Um, so I can see where that would be very beneficial for, for your clients. Um, but I know, actually, I don't know, I was told, and I don't really know anything about it, but that there is like a legislative update. Yeah, certainly. So, so one thing that the Florida legislature and in addition to my legal practice, um, I, I also do lobby the legislature uh, for various clients and associations across the state. Um, and really, when I do that, I mainly focus on Florida tax policy. And that's one area where the Florida legislature always comes in and changes and has new ideas. Um, even if it's just to provide back to school sales tax holidays and things like that, that we're all used to, there's always a number of changes every year in the tax policy realm. So yeah, there were a number of changes in 2023 that potentially impact, you know, some of your members and listeners too. Um, happy to kind of talk through some of those. Yeah, that would be great because I don't know a thing about taxes um, or updates. I know. Okay. I will say this. I, I worked for a CPA for four years while I was in college and um, I remember that I used the one of the tax codes as like a computer monitor stand. It was like thick enough that it, you know, propped it up uh, to be eye level at my desk. So that's as far into the tax code as I got. <laughs> and it, I know it that- worked, It went great for Zoom, right? You yeah. get your laptop up, absolutely. <laughs> they really do. But I know that even um, that tax code has changed. And uh, so, yeah, I would love to hear about, um, all things Florida tax legislative update that you can provide us with. Okay, well, we're happy to start and just talk about a couple things and feel free to stop me if you wanna kind of get deeper into any of them. Um, one of the things I know that, I know that there's a, a certainly an agricultural focus that you guys have, correct? Yes. <laughs> so there's a, a number of sales tax exemptions for, uh, for farmers and for those in the agricultural business. Uh, things like tractors and seed and all sorts of various things. But one new thing that the legislature created an exemption for last year was barbed wire and hog wire fencing, right? So you think about cattle, you think about um, other type of livestock that you would want to uh, protect and contain in an area, and those items would be exempt from sales tax. But what's interesting, and one thing to note about Florida's sales tax law, and specifically why I think one of the reasons that we get so many legislative changes is because those exemptions that are put in place by the legislature are very, very narrowly construed. So they're, they're construed against the, the company that's trying to take the exemption in favor of the state. And what happened was a lot of... Um, farmers and cattlemen that had pushed hard to get the barbed wire and hog wire fencing exemption uh, were initially under the impression that that might include other types of fencing, temporary fencing, um, things that may not be specifically barbed wire or hog wire, you know, wooden fencing, those types of things that are used for the same purpose. But the Florida Department of Revenue took the position, and probably rightfully so, that uh, no, if the legislature said barbed wire and hog wire, those are the only things that are exempt. But what the 2023 legislature did was they came back and they essentially did what likely should have been done last year. And they said, no, they said any permanent or temporary fencing that's used to contain process, um, you know, and, and they, they did make it this year. They made it specific to cattle. Um, okay. Like, they did create an exemption, so that's going to include, that's going to make an exemption for things like, you know, your temporary panels that you may move around in a corral or temporary corrals, you know, wooden fencing, any of those things uh, that you can specifically point to whether or not if they're being used specifically to contain or used in the processing of, of cattle for things like dairy or, or um or just general meat and yeah so it was the legislature's intent to include maybe all kinds of fen not all kinds of fencing but multiple types of fencing and not just specifically you know this type of barbed wire or this type of like squared fence 
but but really the the main purpose of, of telling that story is obviously number one to tell your listeners there's a new sales tax exemption but number two just explain the importance of the words right the words and the the legislative bills and the statutes they really matter um and it's an important thing to keep up with uh we like to joke in tallahassee that um nobody's safe when the legislature's in town <laughs> um, but you know that can that can also certainly go to to an individual's be- benefit too because there's a lot of good things the legislature does for businesses around the state and well yeah you know. i think that this exemption you know is an example of that as far as um you know maybe giving these um ag users of a tax break um you know i think that that's very beneficial to these landowners or lessors um you know they have to keep we got to keep these animals enclosed so uh you know i think it's a wonderful wonderful uh incentive or or exemption and before it did not include the fence posts staples t posts any of that stuff and it does now correct oh yeah Okay. Yeah. So it, it really, it's, it's, it's certainly helpful. Yeah. Um, another helpful thing that they did in the legislative arena this year, and this was actually something that was pushed by the new agricultural commissioner, Wilton Simpson, um, was to create a new, you know, I mentioned earlier, there's, there's probably about 12 or 15 different sales tax exemptions that farmers can take advantage of. But the problem is pretty much for most all of those before what you'd have to do is the farmer would essentially have to sign an affidavit, give it to his vendor as much and explain, you know, swear that they were going to be using the item for an agricultural purpose. Okay. And if they weren't doing that, then it would, it would protect the vendor. It would protect the, the retailer. But it would say that essentially if the Department of Revenue um, found out that you used it for the wrong purpose, they'd go after the farmer and not not the business that sold it. So that was a very cumbersome process before. And in order, in able to, in order to streamline that a bit, uh, Florida decided to borrow something that farmers in Georgia have had, I think, for quite some time. In Georgia, they have what's called the GATE card, G-A-T-E. Um, and I don't know specifically what it stands for, but effectively it's issued to farmers and they can just provide that one card, like an ID card to their vendors and it covers all of, it covers all of their qualifying purchases. Okay. So, so Florida is going to be instituting a new card. Their card is going to be the team card, T-E-A-M, um, tax exempt agricultural, I forget what the M is, but, um, but that's going to, that's materials. No, I'm kidding. I don't know what it is. (laughs) That, that should be going into effect, uh, of January one of 2024. And that's going to be administered by both the department of revenue and by the department of ag and consumer services. So starting January one, 2024, uh, these, agricultural well florida's florida Ge- Florida. georgia's is already in place and okay. has been in place so these farmers or you know ranchers will be able to carry around just a card instead of you know maybe five affidavits or different types of forms in order to become or, or, or in order to get their supplies or materials tax-free yeah so it's just going to be one card that they can essentially give to their vendors um and make sure that that they don't get charged tax improperly for those tax exempt items that they're going to be using in their agricultural purposes. So it really is designed to help streamline the process. They can still provide the old affidavits if they preferred the old way, but you know, just an opportunity to to streamline things, make things easier, if uh, is in everybody's best interest. And the vendor has to know which items are applicable for tax exemption. Yeah, so the vendor will still need to know generally, um, but that is a good point. That and and most vendors that that regularly sell to these types of individuals, mm-hmm. these these agricultural businesses, generally know that. Uh, but you're right; it's it's certainly something that's that that will be needed to know. Hmm. 
Okay. No, I think that that's uh, both of those, the um, fencing uh, and the uh, card are in the best interest of um, farmers or ag users. And um, so I guess good on the legislature for this one. <laughs> exactly. Now, now one more for, for agricultural side, just, just for me to note, um, and this is not on the sales tax side, but on the property tax side. And specifically, I think, you know, most everybody's familiar with property taxes in Florida and, you know, any farmer is going to be familiar with the green belt or the agricultural classification, which lowers their property values. Um, and, but those are the, those are your ad valorem property values. Those are your, those are your property taxes based on the value of your property. So the other thing are special assessments. Those are things for like waste and fire and there are various other special assessments that get levied at the local level. Mm -hmm. Well, the 2023 legislature included another provision that's going to benefit farmers and individuals that have property that's that's uh, deemed agricultural for property tax purposes, and that is a straight prohibition on those special assessments. So that's so kind of a big deal. That is going to be a very big deal starting next year. So that'll start January one as well. Correct. Okay. So that'll that'll be prospective moving forward. Um, it's going to be interesting to watch how that develops kind of over time, I think. Yeah. Um, because those special assessments normally have to apply equally to people. But obviously, you know, so there's there's kind of competing interest, right? You you have somebody, you have a local government that levies a fire assessment for buildings. And then they have, they may have similar assessments on ag lands that, you know, it's just, it's a different class of property. And so it's going to be interesting to see how that kind of changes and adapts over time, but it is, it's certainly a huge benefit that was uh, put in place by the legislature this year. Do you it. think that that will be challenged at all? Because you're, you know, I know that, um, well, I don't know, but these special assessments uh, kind of being a blanket over all um, in an area, you know, do you think that the non-agricultural users are going to uh, kind of challenge this? There, there's certainly a potential, okay. right? Okay, yeah. There's, or there's a potential that local governments may challenge the prohibition uh, for similar reasons. It's it's going to be an area that's going to be, um, I think it's going to be interesting to watch over the next couple of years to see how it all kind of flushes itself out. Uh, but again, hopefully at the end of the day, it's going to save Florida's farmers uh, substantial amounts so that they can continue to do what they're doing because it's an important part of Florida's economy. Well, it's an important part of, <clears throat> I think, Florida and, uh, you know, the U.S. And in general, I know we were talking the other day about whenever the prices of beef went up because there, there was like a drought and so that then there wasn't enough cattle. And um, so certainly a class of people that uh, deserves to be protected because <laughs> without them, um, I don't know, maybe we're what all we eating we grass. Yeah. What are we eating? <laughs> Uh, so I, I think that those are, um, wonderful, uh, you know, incentives for these farmers and ag users and, uh, hopefully they're happy. Certainly. Agreed. Now, did you lobby for any of those, uh, three things? Um, I you... did. I, I worked on, I worked on pretty much each of those. So nice. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah, give yourself a little credit. Yeah, <laughs> um, is lobbying fun? By the way, it's um, interesting. it's interesting, <laughs> right? It's it's a it's a. I I also have younger people ask me what it's like being a lobbyist, um, and I and I run this explanation by a number of lobbyist friends, and they all kind of chuckle and agree, but I say it's it's really the ultimate roller coaster ride. It's the highest of highs and the lowest of lows, and sometimes they're ten seconds apart. Mm. Oh God! It's a it's a really fun process um, when 
when you're helping kind of set the strategy and the policy, it it can be a much more difficult process when you're trying to change something that that they have an idea of it going a different way. Yeah. Uh, but it's it's a lot of um, you know I I also find it really to be a way that we can provide full service uh, legal representation to our clients because there are there's so many attorneys that that deal either on the you know administrative or deal at court or you know deal on business to business type issues or those types of things and um, what we can do is we can really we can push through issues and even if you're unsuccessful we can go in and then work with the legislature to maybe clarify or amend the law to fix an issue for someone and then at the same time maybe turn around and work with that agency to implement that properly and correctly so it's really kind of full circle um, you can we can represent people in, in all aspects of legal issues with especially with florida agencies to me that's the ultimate negotiation getting the government to change their <laughs> to change their laws it, it's it's a good it's a good bargaining chip yeah <laughs> Linda, you just want everybody to bend their rules to fit you, right? Um, I don't think, is there uh, something wrong with that? No, no, I was just wondering. <laughs> no, uh, I want to be able to make them bend their rules. It's not that I necessarily want the rules bent. It's just that I want to know that I can, you know, I can talk them into it. What's is that? one of the other things that you guys are working on is uh, the Florida business rent tax? So Florida business rent tax is certainly something uh, Florida legislature has been working on for a number of years. I've been working on with uh, the backing of a number of clients and associations that are trying to get that reduced and ultimately eliminated. Um, you may not know Florida is the only state in the nation that that has a sales tax on commercial leases. And uh, that would have been really helpful for me about three years ago when people were fighting me on something that I couldn't change. But now I know. Yeah. Th and that's the thing. It's funny because there's there's so many people that are from Florida that I think just those that know about it, I think they think that it's everywhere. So so those businesses um, that are out of state normally don't know about it. And so they may be operating in a state leasing property or being a landlord and not understanding um, the the sales tax on commercial leases is the number one issue at the Florida Department of Revenue in sales tax audits. So it's the number one audited issue. It's the number one protested issue. Uh, they The Department of Revenue regularly does campaigns all across the state where they cross check kind of business addresses with who the owner of the property is and they'll send that owner of the property a, a little letter that says, you know, we think you may be leasing your property to a business that's operating there. Tell us about it. You know, are you receiving any compensation? And it's something that really tricks up, trips up people. Um, the, the other thing too, which can kind of get, you know, just, just a one little nuance. I'll give a quick example of the business rent tax and how it'll trip up people. Is so what's taxable is the total rental consideration received by the landlord. And that even includes pursuant to the department's rules, things like property taxes that are paid by the tenant. So if you lease your property to an individual and uh, they are paying your property taxes, even if they pay those property taxes directly to the tax collector, they don't even give it to the landlord. The Department of Revenue takes the position that you're also supposed to pay sales taxes on those property taxes. So it's a tax on a tax and it drives people insane. Um, but it's it's the current kind of status of the law. So the legislature recognizes that, that this is a, a significant tax burden on Floridians and Florida businesses, and it's unique to Florida. And so starting in 2017, they started reducing the state tax rate. So I think most, you know, I think you and all your listeners know that the general sales tax rate uh, in the state of Florida is 6%. And um, so when you go buy something like a book at the store, it's 6% plus your whatever your local county rates would be. Those range generally from 
half a percent to one and a half percent. So what the state started doing to, to ultimately, hopefully eliminate the business rent tax was they started reducing that rate and they really only did it a little bit at first. So starting yeah. in 2018, I think they reduced it 0.2%, a whopping six to 5.8 <laughs> reduction. Um, but the reason why they were so hesitant and, and a little bit of background is the a lot of the things that drive the policy at the state level is obviously the financial impacts. So one of the requirements for the Florida legislature is to pass a balanced budget every year. So they really have to pay attention not only to the revenues that are coming in, but any revenues that they may be, you know, new exemptions or things that they may be passing. And what took so long for the legislature to start working on the business rent tax was that fiscal impact. So back in the mid 2015, 2016 timeframe, it was estimated that tax was generating about $1.8 billion for the state of Florida every year. Um, so it gets expensive, you know, even 0.2% yeah. uh, is, is a significant amount of money. And so in 2018, they did 0 0.2. In 2019, they did another 0 0.1 to get to 5.7. Uh, the following year, in, in 2019, they passed, but it went into effect in 2020, another 0.2. So we got down to five and a half percent. And then we obviously got hit with the pandemic and the during the 2020 session. The 2020 legislature didn't pass any permanent uh, reductions in any taxes, so business rent tax or anything else. Uh, but then in 2021, the state of Florida passed uh, an online sales tax bill. And so if you don't mind, I'm going to geek out just for a minute on the tax stuff. Uh, back in 2018, the U.S. Supreme Court uh, did a, a huge decision a decision that was 50 years in the making in, in my world that allowed states to more easily tax uh, out-of-state businesses that sold online or sold through marketplaces, things like, you know, Amazon, Walmart.com, eBay, those, you know, those types of places that you would think about. And so it did take Florida some time to catch on. We were out of the 45 states in the nation that charge sales tax, we were second last. Uh, but the Florida legislature did pass legislation in 2021 that essentially um, allowed the state to start collecting from those individuals. The one other thing that I just wanna mention is those taxes were always due before 2021. What, it, what we had was you and I, when we purchased online, we were supposed to fill out a quarterly return and send in our own taxes to the Florida Department of Revenue. We totally did that every time. <laughs> Just in, if the federal government, if the IRS is listening, we obviously, everybody in this room did that. No, I just didn't buy anything online ever, yeah. ever. <laughs> okay. So I totally did what I was supposed to do. <laughs> so that the irony of it is so that the, Back when we were at the department, back when I was at the department, we actually had a, a long standing joke because the form that you were supposed to send that in happened to be called the, the DR 15 MO and the MO technically stood for mail order because it was designed for back in the day when we had mail order catalogs. But we used to joke at the department that the MO stood for management only because only the department of revenue management staff would actually <laughs> file those returns. Nobody else in the state of Florida. <laughs> Yeah, we're all straight to jail. <laughs> it, it, people just didn't understand. And, and and it's, you know, and it makes sense why people didn't understand. But because that we were able to, the legislature was able to pass that online, what it meant was, is that instead of us having to pay the taxes directly, we, our vendors would collect it and send it to Florida. And the legislature estimated that that change and just in, that simple change in policy was going to increase Florida revenue collections just because it's easier to administer. Again, kind of talking a little bit about the team card. When things get easier, um, then it, when administration gets easier, it's easier to do it the right way, either exempting things or collecting the right amount of tax. 
And so what the legislature did was they said, we're going to have an influx of funds. And again, remember, this is in spring of 2021 when all this is going on. Florida had, we had really kind of just pulled ourselves out of uh, kind of the, the, the deep reductions that we had from the pandemic from Florida shutting down for a couple months in spring of 2020. And uh, as a result of that, and also because of businesses shut down and because of layoffs, Florida had a huge drain on the unemployment system. Yeah. And one of the important things that the 2021 legislature did was they essentially froze unemployment compensation rates for employers. So they said, your rates aren't going to go up just because we had a huge drain on our system during the pandemic. So that was a huge benefit to businesses, a huge temporary benefit. So they said, we're going to take this extra online sales tax money and refill the unemployment compensation trust fund. And we're not going to raise those unemployment taxes on, on employers. But there's going to reach a time when that trust fund is, is replenished back to pre-pandemic levels. And then what are we going to do with the money after that? And so what the legislature decided to do is they said, we're going to slash the sales tax on commercial leases or the business rent tax as soon as that trust fund's rebuilt. And so what that means for Florida tenants and Florida landlords is that um, the current projection is that that trust fund is going to be replenished next year and that August 1st of 2024 the sales tax on commercial leases is going to be reduced at the state level down to 2%, which is a huge. Yeah, reduction. that's a, that's, um, that's big. It's, it's projected to save $1.2 billion a year. So that goes into place in August. So for the first, well, it's likely to go into place. Right, right. Yeah. So if it goes into effect in August, so they're paying 5.5% until August and then 2% after August? So so that's how it was until the 2023 legislature got involved. <laughs> <laughs> so the 2023 legislature decided to provide some additional relief even earlier. So starting, and, and of course, right, they, they want to make it, diff <laughs> they want to make it a little complicated for everybody. Um, I, I feel for the landlords, especially those that at one point used to put actual tax rates in their leases because they would have, they're probably going, pulling their hair out now with the legislature continuously changing the tax rates. Um, but the 2023 legislature included in their bill a reduction from five and a half to four and a half percent that starts December 1 of this year. So December 1 of this year, we're getting about $300 million in relief in this, in, from five and a half to four. And then in August, we're gonna get that additional relief where it goes down to 2%. So, so. yeah, like the, your local taxes, um, if they were 1%, so then with the state tax and your uh, county tax, right? It'll be 3% or, or you know, whatever. Correct. And so I can tell you that the legislature is very committed. And I think the next legislature is going to work even further to get the state rate under the 2% moving forward. Wow. Uh, but the real question I think is going to be what happens after the state gets to zero? Because then the question becomes, do we, does the legislature tell the locals that they can no longer tax the business rent tax at with their local rates, or do they run the state to zero and still allow the locals to, to tax? There's, there's a little bit of precedence with that in the state of Arizona. Arizona used to have a similar tax that they did away with. The state ran it to a 0% rate, but they still have some cities in, in the state of Arizona that are allowed to charge their amount. And so it'll be interesting to watch over the next couple of years to see where Florida ultimately lands. But I can tell you there's a lot of people in the business community and the legislature seems willing to hopefully eliminate the tax, kind of similar to uh, the Florida's elimination of the intangibles tax back in the 90s under Governor Jeb Bush. 
And now I just want to be clear, that doesn't mean that you're not getting taxed on your income producing properties. It just means that the sales tax uh, is being hopefully eliminated. You're very serving, good. Yeah. Very good. Very good clarification. Yes, this is this is only related to that that unique Florida sales tax on somebody else using your piece of property and paying you for it. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, at least I I, I can understand a little bit, not a lot, but yeah. Maybe I'm just glad that I'm not rich enough to have a piece of property that somebody rents. That you're not so a landlord? Yes. Are you thankful, Chad? Yes, so that, you know, I don't have to deal with these taxes. <laughs> but here's the thing, Chad, if you were a tenant, you'd have to deal with it too. It'd be yeah. out of your pocket. So so one of the other things, just as a, as a side note, um, kind of the Florida budget, if you want me to talk about that a little bit, because again, that's one thing that plays in so much in the legislative process in Tallahassee. It's really interesting. So Florida, we have a general revenue fund, which is essentially the state's checking account that they can use for any purpose. Uh, they, we also have federal funds and we have other state funds that are placed in trust funds that are supposed to go towards individual uses. So the state's general revenue fund uh, is mainly filled by sales taxes. I think about 85% of uh, general revenue fund comes from sales taxes which includes the, the business rent tax that we mentioned earlier and other things. But one thing that's really interesting to kind of look at, and I've been looking at recently, is how the state of Florida did through the pandemic. So prior to the pandemic, uh, we, the state of Florida collected about 30 to $33 billion a year in general revenue for the few years before the pandemic. Uh, we had a, a slight dip, like I mentioned, those last few months of the state fiscal year that ended June 30th, 2020. Call Dean Mead for your business law, estate planning, real estate law, or litigation needs toll free today at 877-363-8992 or visit our website at deanmead.com. That's D-E-A-N-M-E-A-D dot com.